Okay, so in this final video of this week, uh, we're going to look at something called block performance, which is a rather simple uh, way of um, of producing some performance analysis for a given aircraft. Um, we make use of the Breguet range equation, uh, so we have to actually apply those uh, conditions um, of cruise climb as caveats to the analysis. But nevertheless, it's quite a powerful way of um, of looking at uh, an initial aircraft performance first order analysis. So the first thing I want to do is just have a quick look at the um, Breguet range equation again. Um, and what we see in this first box is the Breguet range equation for thrust producing engines. This is the one that we derived in the previous video by integrating the specific air range equation for thrust producing engines across a given uh, cruise leg. Um, and remember the conditions for for this particular integration is that the velocity needs to remain constant and the uh, lift coefficient needs to remain constant um, in order for these terms to be taken out of the integral. So that means that we must allow the aircraft to cruise climb, uh, so climb as it burns fuel. Um, the same conditions can be applied to the other um, equations for specific air range and indeed specific endurance. And we can use those same equations to uh, and integrate those with respect to the aircraft weight to produce similar term, uh, similar uh, equations. So we've got the Breguet range equation for power producing engines. And remember, we've got this um, prop propulsive efficiency factor in there for the for the propeller of the of the engine. Um, and we can also do the same with specific endurance. Um, uh, but in this case, the equations look very slightly different. In the case of thrust producing engines, we lose that velocity on the top and we gain the velocity on the bottom in the power producing engines. What I want to talk about next is something called the block fuel ratio. And this is a, a, a way of rewriting the Breguet range equation, um, but making that term in brackets independent of the aircraft weight. And the way we do that is by defining a new, uh, a new term, which we call block fuel ratio and we use the symbol zeta for that. So the block fuel ratio is the proportion of the total aircraft weight that's made up by fuel. Okay, So we define that as relative to the weight at the start of the cruise leg um, and this, this weight WF represents all of the fuel that's burned in, burned in a particular cruise segment over which we're trying to integrate the specific air range to get that total range for that particular cruise leg. Um, so what we can do is if we look at those the terms in the brackets there, uh, clearly the end weight is going to be equal to the initial weight minus the fuel burned in that particular leg. And we can introduce this term into the, uh, into the term in brackets. So it allows us to rewrite that term in brackets as WI over WE is equal to WI over WI minus W. F, and if we divide the top and bottom through by WI, we end up with 1 over 1 minus WF over WI, and we see that that's WF over WI is just the block fuel ratio, which is zeta, so we can say that WI over WE is equal to 1 over 1 minus that block fuel ratio. And that allows us to rewrite the Breguet range equation for thrust producing engines. In this case, is equal to V over CTP uh, multiplied by G over the multiplied by the lift to drag ratio multiplied by the natural log of one minus uh, one over one minus zeta. Okay, and this is really helpful to us because we're not thinking about the absolute total value of the of the weight of the aircraft at the start of the cruise. We're just thinking in terms of the proportion of the aircraft that's made up by fuel, and that's useful to us because we can then plot graphs like this. Um, in this particular graph, what I've done is I've produced a, a sort of a set of generic uh, values for. Uh, for a kind of commercial commercial airliner, kind of Airbus A320 kind of size. If we imagine that we've got three cases here, 
that we're actually simulating. Um, the first is the this blue line here, and that represents uh, the optimal flight conditions. Okay, so we looked at, um, at what uh, at the CL4 maximum specific air range, and we said that when we are um, flying at the fastest potential uh, possible Mach number for our air for out for our aircraft which is given by our max operating Mach number. Um, when we multiply that by the local speed of sound, when that becomes equal to the local best velocity for maximum specific air range, uh, the point at which those two lines cross gives us our very best um, optimal f uh, flight velocity and our optimal flight altitude. So this first case is our absolute optimal best. And actually, we find that the flight level that this corresponds to for this particular aircraft is quite high. Um, it's about 400, flight level 420, which is unrealistically high, actually. Um, we wouldn't be flying that high. Uh, it would cost a lot of money to get to that altitude, and actually, um, it might even be beyond the... I think it's actually beyond the service ceiling of this particular aircraft. But theoretically, this is what it turns out to be. Um, the next two lines are slightly suboptimal conditions. The second one, which is the green one, is what we call the manufacturer's cruise uh, conditions. So the manufacturer will specify a particular Mach number and a particular flight altitude and give some point performance data based on those conditions. So it might, you might get a thrust specific fuel consumption at that Mach number and that flight altitude. So we've picked a value of 0.85 for Mach number and an altitude of um, uh, flight level 360. The third uh, case is uh, a suboptimal case, which is just a generic cruise condition at non optimal conditions, um, where the Mach number we've said is going to be 0 0.8 and the flight altitude is flight level 320. The reason I've included a third one is really just for comparison to show you how much of a difference it makes to be flying at uh, either a lower altitude or um, non-optimal conditions and again we use the Mach number and flight altitude to calculate the true airspeed uh, and the lift to drag ratio in order to get those uh, operating parameters for a given uh, aircraft weight weight okay so half e half uh, rho v squared scl okay um, Right, so what we see from this graph, and what I'll do is I'll provide the MATLAB code for, for all of this so you can have a, you can peruse that to see how I've done it. So what we see on here is that um, as we change the, the block fuel ratio, so let's just get our block fuel ratio equation back again. So that's up here. So all I've got here is the range for the, this, this range for thrust producing engines. We've got the velocity and lift to drag ratio as determined by the lift equation and the speed of sound equation for those three conditions. Uh, and we've got an array of block fuel ratios. So as we change the block fuel ratios, we change the proportion of fuel that's, that the aircraft is made up of, we get a, a, a higher uh, range, which makes total sense. The further we fly, the uh, sorry, the more fuel we put in the aircraft, the further we fly. But remember, it's not necessarily about the absolute amount of fuel. It's about the proportion of the aircraft that's made up of fuel. Okay, And for this, for our, the typical range that we've, we've chosen here is kind of reflects um, maybe typical numbers for a commercial airliner. I mean, these values of 10% of, uh, of the aircraft weight made up of fuel, that's quite, it's quite low, really. It's probably more like between 20, 30, and maybe up to 40% fuel so I've just gone up to 30% here and you can see for this particular aircraft let's pick say uh, when there's a fuel a block fuel ratio of 20% um, we see a difference in the overall range of the aircraft between those three cases spanning probably around about I'd say about 2,000 uh, kilometers so that's quite considerable so you can go another 2,000 kilometers if you can manage to fly at those optimal conditions. 
so now I want to talk about something called block performance, which is uh, a rather simple approach, um, which is used to determine the, the total fuel mass or the total time required to fly a given aircraft range. So it's a, it uses the Breguet range equation, but uh, but in reverse instead. Um, it, we usually use optimal flight conditions for this, and that's what I've done in these two graphs here. Um, but suboptimal uh, conditions can also be used. Um, so we typically use the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft as well, um, and we might fly it at uh, at those that particular optimal altitude, flight altitude. Um, but we we use we still make use of the Breguet range equation, but what we do with the Breguet range equation is we rewrite it. So if you remember the Breguet range equation looks something like this, V over G C T P, L over D, natural log of 1 over 1 minus the uh, block fuel ratio. And what we want instead of the range being found by a given block fuel ratio, we want the block fuel ratio to be found by a given aircraft range. Um, so we rearrange the whole equation. Um, so if I put 1 over 1 minus block fuel ratio is equal to um, exponential of the range multiplied by g times ctp all over the velocity. Uh, and then we've got 1 over the lift to drag ratio. Okay, and we can um, flip this upside down and put the block fuel ratio as being equal to 1 minus exponential RG CTP over V, 1 over L over D, all to the minus 1. Okay. So this is our, uh, what we call our block performance uh, calculator. Um, and I've used this formula to generate these, the, the graph on the left hand side. The graph on the right was simply just the, um, calculated by that time, so let's call it T, is equal to the, the range divided by the the velocity. We know that that velocity has got to stay constant along the cruise so um, this is obviously units of um, uh, units of time seconds and I've converted it into hours. So what we get from these two graphs is the total mass of fuel. So to get the total mass of fuel in kilograms or in tons I've had to multiply the block fuel ratio that's been calculated from this equation um, by the um, the maximum takeoff weight. Okay, uh, multiplied by g multiplied by the fuel. Uh, block fuel ratio. Um, I think I've actually presented this in terms of kilogram in terms of a mass actually, but um, obviously that's just the, the weight of fuel divided by divided by G. Okay? Um, and what we can see that for ex let's say if we wanted to fly a range of five thousand kilometers, we know in this case we would have to, we would have to load the aircraft with with twenty tons of fuel. Um, in this case I've included some reserve fuel Okay, so we do need some reserve fuel, uh, a contingency for in case there's not a landing spot when we come into land, or if we can't land at a given airport, for example, it might be foggy. Um, so that's why the the uh, y intercept isn't at zero. And again, with block time, we can see how long the aircraft can stay in the air for uh, for a given aircraft range as well. So how long that particular trip is going to be taking for. Uh, given aircraft range, and that's quite useful again for flight path planning. Um, if you're doing your, the economics of your flight. Okay, so the last thing I want to touch on is actually something called fuel economy, which is uh, a way of performing performance analysis of our aircraft um, to determine how how fuel efficient they are. Um, 
And this allows direct comparison between different aircraft types as well. If we go look at fuel economy on Wikipedia, there's a, there's a nice article there. Um, the Wikipedia page is good because it gives you these big tables which allows you to compare lots of different aircraft. Um, and you can look at this in your own spare time. But you'll see uh, these two columns. One is fuel burn uh, expressed as kilograms per kilo kilometer and the other is fuel efficiency per seat. Now, not all the aircraft that we're analyzing in the coursework uh, have passenger seats. Uh, sometimes the payload is, is armaments or cargo, uh, not necessarily people. So you'll have to have a think about how you want to express the fuel economy. Um, but in this example, it's expressed in terms of the liters of fuel burned per 100 kilometers traveled uh, per seat or per person traveling. So I wanted to show how we might uh, use our Breguet range equation to calculate those uh, fuel efficiency terms. So again, we are going to we're going to apply it to the three cases that we've um, we've talked about already, um, and we use the same the same input values as well. Um, but we need to just talk about one other other thing, and that's the uh, operating empty weight and the maximum takeoff weight. Um, when we're looking at the weight breakdown of an aircraft, and we will do this in more detail uh, when we do payload range chart, this top line here, if this is weight as a sort of on the y-axis, if you like, um, aircraft weight, this here represents our maximum takeoff weight, so we can't actually fly any, uh, take off any, any heavier than that. This is a more typical takeoff weight. Okay you have a lot of the weight of the aircraft is made up by the structure and we call it the operating empty weight because we need to be carrying that weight no matter how far we're flying or how much payload we're carrying uh, it's all the support structures, it's the wings it's the, um, it's the engines uh, it's all of the, um, the, the facilities on board we call that the operating empty weight and then you're left with this, this uh, portion here which we call this the useful load and that's split up between fuel and payload and if we increase the fuel fraction we know that we're going to fly further but we might have to do that at an expense of, of payload or if we've still got some capacity below the maximum takeoff weight we can just keep increasing the total take takeoff weight until we reach that maximum um, but that's obviously therefore is the block fuel ratio multiplied by the current takeoff weight. Okay, and in order to uh, to examine the the fuel burn um, as a function of aircraft range, so we want to perform the Breguet range equation with different fuel uh, block fuel ratios. So different values of zeta, but we also need different values of takeoff weight. Okay, um, we're going to assume a constant payload fraction of twenty percent. So that's uh, zero point two times the takeoff weight. And of course, if we keep adding fuel, if we keep adding uh, zeta, then the total payload will also have to increase as well because uh, we're increasing the total takeoff weight and it's obviously a bit of a, a hypothetical situation but it's the only fair way of doing it without knowing exactly what we're carrying so we say that the payload fraction is always 20 percent and what you actually do as part of your coursework is in, examine the effect of changing the payload fraction as well uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in future um, in future videos um, so we first need to have a definition for our takeoff weight um, in terms of our uh, fuel fraction and our payload fraction and our operating empty weight. So it's the OEW plus the fuel fraction plus I'm going to call this I'm going to call this uh, pi. So plus pi times the takeoff weight 
Okay. And we can factorize that. So we end up with OEW plus um, plus zeta. Okay. And we can um, subtract that from the left hand side. So we end up with take off weight 1 minus pi minus zeta equals OEW. Therefore, the takeoff weight is equal to the operating empty weight all divided by 1 minus pi minus zeta. Okay, so for a range of values of zeta, we're going to get a range of takeoff weights. And we use that takeoff weight in our equation for lift. So we need to work out our lift coefficient at our stated altitude. So CL is equal to uh, 2 times that takeoff weight all over um, P times gamma times m squared times wing area. So again, we know our Mach number, that's there. Our pressure, we have to work out our pressure from our given altitude. So we use our um, altitude equation, ISA, uh, ISA law. So that gives us the lift coefficient. And we use that lift coefficient to work out our L over D. So L over D is equal to CL over CD naught plus KCL squared. Uh, the V is simply, our true air speed is simply our local speed of sound multiplied by our Mach number, because that we also know from, um, uh, from the function of altitude. Okay. It's also a function of altitude because it's a function of the temperature. Okay. And we've got everything we need now to calculate our range as a function of that uh, range of block fuel ratios. Okay, so we've got our V, we've got our thrust specific fuel consumption, we've got our lift to drag ratio. And we've got our, of course, our block fuel ratio. Okay, so that gives us a a, a load of different ranges for loads of different uh, block fuel ratios and accounting for the changes to the takeoff weight as a result of changing the block fuel ratio. So what I've done in this graph here is I've put that range on the x-axis, but what I've also done is I've calculated that value of that total value of fuel in kilograms which is given by that uh, quantity there and I've divided that by um, the total range which is on the x-axis as well and what we can see from the resulting curves is quite interesting we see that of course the optimal flight condition is providing us with the lowest fuel burn per kilometre, so the lowest amount of kilograms burnt per kilometre. Um, and as we go to less, to less optimal uh, flight conditions, the fuel burn increases. And we can see it's actually quite a considerable amount. So for a long journey, you know, 2,000 kilometres, that would soon stack up the additional fuel you'd have to carry uh, to, to fly those suboptimal conditions. Um, the usual sort of shape that you see um, is this kind of thing on most aircraft and uh, so it's a bit more exaggerated than what we've what we see in these these plots and that's because the aircraft isn't flying always those optimal conditions um, but you generally find a kind of a sweet spot in the middle somewhere um, and that is usually the design range of the of the aircraft um, so I'd like you to have a go at trying to produce this plot for uh, for the coursework as well um, so we can also use this data to find out the uh, the fuel burn per unit of payload being carried. 
Um, and if you remember back to this table, this is what exactly what's been done here, except we're seeing the fuel uh, burn in terms of liters of fuel rather than kilograms, and we're seeing it per 100 kilometers of, of, of range traveled. And in this case, it's per passenger seat, but we're going to do it per, per kilogram of payload being carried. Um, so the way we do that is we take our fuel burn in kilograms and we divide it by the density of fuel okay and that's in kgs per meters cubed that gets us a volume of fuel okay in liters then what we need to do is we need to work out how much is burned per 100 kilometers so we need to multiply that by 100 okay and then what we need to do is we want to find out uh, how much is burned per per kilo of payload carried so uh, that's going to be dividing that by the payload fraction so that was pi wasn't it multiplied by the takeoff weight okay so that's from top down down there let's use use green okay so that's per kilogram of payload and then again if we want to have that in terms of per 100 kilograms of payload carried then we need to multiply by 100 again okay and that gets us the fuel economy, which is litres of fuel burned per 100 kilometres per 100 kilograms of payload carried. And we see a similar looking chart to, to the left hand chart really, where we do see an improvement in fuel economy um, with an increasing aircraft range. And again, you'll find out that that's down to the, the design of the aircraft. But remember, not all, not all aircraft are designed to, to carry payload in the most expedient manner or the cheapest manner. Um, there are lots of other factors to be included, especially if you're you're looking at a high performance aircraft. Um, but once you do this analysis, it should be quite revealing and, and quite interesting. So I do hope you get something out of it. Okay.